Helen, uh, let's start with you and then uh, I'll do some introductions um, after that, if you could lead us off. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Helen Bishop, Kimak Nyunga, that's my language for good to see you. Today, I open this session about Indigenous insight in peace building with a welcome to country. And on behalf of all First Nation people of Australia, of which there's many, we warmly welcome each participant to hear the voices that are carried by our ancestors through us. They are carried into our stories about kinship, relatedness, um, about connectivity, obligation and responsibility. Each of these um, precious qualities are attributed to, to the deep wisdom of our ancestors. These mindful ob obligations and ob observations are of our ecological community, of our lands, of our flora and fauna. Um, and each of us welcome you on behalf of our ancestors. And it is hoped that you all gain much from the voices that share their ancestors' messages. So welcome. Helen, thank you. And um, it just caused me to think about where I am right now. I'm speaking, I'm living and learning in Brisbane, Australia, and that's on the land of the Turbo and uh, Jagra people. So. We respect them. Hopefully our attention to the subject today will honor them too and and there will be a deepening of all of our you know thinking about what it means to be indigenous and what it means to be uh, one society together. I had the opportunity to talk with Helen with Mong and Richa and their bios are available online and I, I want to emphasize that yeah, from my perspective what we share is a deep interest in peace building from the the perspectives of indigenous peoples. And this is an interesting topic for non-indigenous people because we tend to make a lot of assumptions about the world. An assumption is something that you think without realizing that you think it. And I'll give you an example. The way our conference has been organized, we were invited to start this session with short five minute messages like mini speeches from each of our panelists. So the hard work is an impressive amount of work that the organizers accomplished made complete sense to me as a non-indigenous white male because I'm used to thinking about an event like this in terms of tightly choreographed time constraints like speaker A gets five minutes, speaker B gets five minutes, speaker C gets five minutes and then we discuss um, a relevant question in common before going to breakout sessions. Well while this makes sense to most of us because many of us assume that uh, time and structure is a priority, the very format that we imposed on our indigenous panelists was a foreign concept compared to the ways that knowledge gets passed along in their own cultures. So inadvertently, we attempted to create a session on indigenous insights to peace building by ignoring the ways that indigenous people might approach peace building. Instead, we imposed um, a non-indigenous model and asked our indigenous speakers to be constrained by speaker A gets five minutes and so on. So an honest re-evaluation of our plan suggests that we, the, the organizers, were guilty of the very thing we hope to address. That is that we assume too often that people in the global north have the right models and the right institutions for peace and that all we have to do is superimpose our ideas onto indigenous peoples so that they can benefit from our vast knowledge and experiences. Of course, it's a really arrogant point of view. And I will add that our liberal approach to peace building globally over the past few decades has not automatically produced peacefulness in societies. So that's an important reason to listen to today's conversation because if we can be a bit more humble and give voice to First Nation peoples and attribute legitimacy to indigenous ideas, perhaps we can move closer to peace building concepts that actually work. 
So I'm delighted to be with Helen, Mong, and Richa because I get to ask them questions and their answers to my questions can enrich us with new ideas and insights into peace building from an indigenous perspective. So we agreed to modify our approach slightly, um, but we're still gonna open with brief remarks uh, from each panelist. They may approach this element differently from one another, but in their introductory remarks, we uh, will set up a direction for a short panel discussion. And what they have to say will be helpful in giving us some context. So um, Mong and, um, and Helen and Richa, I'm gonna turn time to Mong and then we'll follow with Helen and then with Richa in that order and I won't introduce you individually. But uh, let their thoughts be a pretext and then we'll jump to some, uh, some Q&A as soon as they get finished. Mong, we'll go straight to you. Does Mong, Mong have his... Um... Yeah, sorry. Mong? There yeah, we go. Uh, yeah, there you are. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, Riko Baya, and good afternoon, everyone. I feel extremely honored and privileged uh, to be here with you all today. My name is Mong Marma. I come from a Marma indigenous community from the Chittagan Hill Treks region in Bangladesh. Even though currently I'm living on this uh, beautiful land called Australia and far away from my community and people, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, I feel I'm still strongly connected to the place, home to my community, people, culture, language, and my ancestors. For indigenous peoples, place is not just a piece of land occupied by people and culture, but it's more about the relationship that I have with each and every beings present on my homeland. So the place where I come from is the foundation of my indigenous identity that is intricately knitted through the thread of relationship. For indigenous peoples, this notion of relationship extends beyond the human relationship and integrates all the animate and inanimate beings in natural and spiritual worlds. Mm -hmm. So in other words, this notion of relationship means respect, reciprocity, and responsibility, the way indigenous peoples engage with each other, the land, environment, and the spiritual world. So relationship in, is therefore central to indigenous peoples' ways of being, knowing, and doing. Indigenous approaches to conflict resolution and peace building are one such example where perception of conflict and pursuit of resolution stem from the communal aspiration to maintaining the relationship and restoring balance and harmony. So indigenous approaches to peacemaking involve various forms, including prayer, storytelling, ceremonies, rituals, and the use of humor. So now I'd like to share a story drawn from the experience of one of the Marma traditional chiefs in the Chittagong Hill Treks. As you may know, uh, indigenous knowledge is mainly oral based, generally passed down from generation to generation in the forms of stories, folklore, artworks, songs, dance, and so on. So this story is about a family matter in which a wife and a husband were having some troubles in maintaining their relationship. So they approached the chief to solve the matter. Uh, the wife complained that her husband has not been looking after her, always find, finds issues to quarrel and all sometimes too jealous. And the husband gave his account of the matter saying that he saw her and her friends talking to a young man in the village. And his wife often makes excuses to go visit her girlfriends in the village and go to fetch water from the stream, even though it wasn't necessary. So hearing the case, the chief, accompanied by the council of elders, tried to make peace, but in vain. So they decreed that the pair should be shut up alone, together in an empty room with just one blanket, as it was in the cold weather. So, and, and they would hear the matter again in the morning. So next morning, the chief asked one of his secretaries to call the pair to decide on the case. 
Then the secretary informed the chief that the matter seemed to have been already solved as him and the gateman saw the pair leaving the court early in the dawn, lovingly holding each other's hands and smiles on their faces. So this case is one example uh, of uh, Marmad way of dispute resolution that involves wisdom, humor, and a good understanding of the culture and con context and consideration of the well-being of all parties. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ma. Helen. Well, I'm going to draw on some local um, Northern Territory community practices. Um, but firstly say that Aboriginal communities across the Northern Territory practice a kinship system and that relates everybody's standing to each other in a group, particular to a language group or a land group. And those kinship structures tell you who you may sit with, who you may marry, what you may eat, um, who you can talk to, um, and they locate that, that being with their own um, totems and responsibilities to country, such as myself, I have a name that makes my attention to the place name that I'm named after to care for that and others are to come to me to use that place if they are wanting to hunt on it or swim at it. So that would normally occur, it occurs more in um, Yolno country or um, um, Walpri country, very steeped in this co connectivity with their totems, who you can buy presents for, who you've got to look after, who you can marry, the flora and the fauna you're allowed to eat or not eat, and it's a way of managing the local harvest or environment for um, protein and food. And so it involves everybody in honouring these relationships. And it's through these relationships, these kinship structures that tell people who they may talk with or marry or sit with or or what they're allowed to eat. It tells everybody um, that they have obligations. They're obliged to honour a particular protocol. That protocol is known by the elders. The elders are the holders of this kinship um, system of managing the community when conflicts arise. And so they point to the people who are best to support the parties to talk about their problem so that they might resolve it. It will involve ceremony, it will involve singing, it will involve um, isolation, it'll involve all the elements of human activity and, and the environment to draw on to facilitate um, uh, the problem solving process. Um, I, I don't know what more I can add to uh, Mong's really great description. We've, we ha share very similar um, views um, and esoterical connections to country, to flora, to fauna and to each other. Thank you, Helen and Richard. You have. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Richa Eka and I am an Orao woman uh, from the Kuruk tribes of Eastern India. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to be sharing my story with you. Um, mostly because often, I, I live in Australia, I live in Melbourne, um, I grew up in India and in my time overseas in the past 10 years in between the US and um, Australia, any time I tell people are always just like, where are you from? Um, you know, you, you don't really look Indian. 
um, and I get all of these, um, I guess, feedback from people, right? And often in, in the US or in Australia, I'm, I'm quite okay to say, oh, I'm indigenous and that's why I look like this. And, you know, I belong to this tribe in India. And often the response is what? There are indigenous people in India, but India is such an ancient culture. Um, and that <laughs> usually really triggers me because it tells me that our stories of existence and our existence is just not present in the world. And this is a really huge moment for me because I get to talk about my people that most of the Western world doesn't know about. And a lot of Indians don't know about. Even, even when I'm in different bigger cities in India, often in Delhi or Bombay, people will be like, Eka, what, like, where's that name from? Um, and, and being indigenous in India and overseas is quite complex um, in the sense that when I'm in India, I have a lot of, I, when I'm in India, I have a lot of, um, I'm getting emotional here, um, fear. I have a lot of fear in accepting and owning my identity. And that is because I know that if I do tell people I'm indigenous, I'm tribal, I'm Adivasi, that is how we um, identify ourselves. If I tell people I'm that, I will be targeted. I will be discriminated against. I'll be put in a box um, that they cannot associate with, that they cannot marry that they cannot love. Um, and that, that's how I grew up. And that's how a lot of people in India live with the fear of not being able to be themselves. And in the US or in Australia, when I meet an Indian person, I have that similar sort of anxiety. It hasn't left me. I still continue to when people ask me, oh, you know, where in India are you from? And what, you know, I've never heard your name. I'm afraid that if I tell them that I'm indigenous, they're just going to be like, oh, yeah, we can't be friends anymore. We can't be friends. We can't associate. Because you're lower than me. We don't belong in the same community. And India is such a complex place right i mean if any of you have been to india you've you've experienced the chaos and, and and the magic and just to give you a quick context is that indigenous people in india fall under um the gov the government categorizes us as scheduled tribes and then anybody who's not that is called general category so if you belong to the scheduled tribes um there's really interesting words that the indian government uses to define your characteristics one being primitive uh quite painful that one um as as many other people will other indigenous people will um resonate and we like to call ourselves adivasi and and that is probably one of the most important things that i want to put out there in the world that there is a word, word called Adivasi and Adi means from the beginning and Vasi means resident. And we are, that is our claim to the land and, and the country that we are from in the Eastern part of India. Adivasi, I see you Kat, uh, A-D-I-V-A-S-I. And um, that is a little, little snippet from my heart to all of yours of, what it feels like to be Adivasi and what it has been my experience so far, even though I, I don't live in India any, anymore, it still continues to be with me. And now I can be proud and out about it and I'm accepting this and I've made this my mission in my life to, to be out there and talk about these things and talk about um, Indigenous rights. Um, but I know that many people are still afraid and no one should be afraid of owning up to who they are. That's not the world of peace that we all imagine. That's why we're here. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Rich. And I, I want to thank Mong and Helen, you as well. Um, and let me just say to the group that this has been a, a great experience for me to be a moderator working with these panelists because um, I assume a lot of things. And, uh, and for example, when, when I approach peace building, uh, I think about how, it, how it's addressed often, like with the United Nations, for example. Boutros Boutros Ghali in 1992 uh, talked about um, peace building and he used words like um, prevention, resolution of violent conflicts, reconstruction, avoiding relapse. And so automatically my mind goes back to these, these concepts uh, that are very uh, sort of Western in nature. And what I discovered um, in being able to work closely with Richa and with Helen and with Mong is that we're not necessarily even talking about the same thing. Um, we're, we're talking about peace building that comes more from the heart. Um, peace uh, building that is approached more in terms of storytelling uh, and peace building that has everything to do with identity and, and understanding uh, our, our long genealogies and history. Um, but, but that's, while that's really educational to me, I, I do think about how we talk about in the, in the United Nations, peace building as prevention, resolution of violent conflicts, reconstruction, avoiding relapses. So, so Helen, I would like to ask you a question. Is this concept of peace building similar or different than Aboriginal notions of peace building from your point of view? It is. Can, can you hear me? Yes, you're coming can, across the relay. Yeah, okay. okay. It, is, it is different and the same. The idea of peacemaking and peacekeeping in Aboriginal context is the ever mindfulness about how tenuously relationships can become um, unstable. And so that is why they, the um, communities use this terminology because it is always on the mind of the elders that they continue to um, do peacemaking and peacekeeping in the prevention of violence or the eruption or um, disruption of relatedness. Um, relationships are everything in a language group because it's the governance of the behaviours of the whole community who are obliged to act in particular ways with particular people. So peacekeeping and peacemaking um, and the peacemaker themselves are always mindful of these types of hiccups or eruptions that can occur and have a, in their communities, a global ripple across the community. Did that answer? Yes, I, I wanna just delve a little bit deeper to um, ask you about structural violence. And I'm thinking in Northern Territory, oh, yes. um, mm about how structural violence uh, exists, even though we, we create um, legislation, for example, to try and abolish discrimination? Well, structural violence occurs, well, I can give you a really good example of it in practice and in legislation, is in the Northern Territory in 2007, um, the army was sent into Aborig 79 Aboriginal communities, signs were put up, a uh, piece of legislation was established and those signs said, they're huge signs as you're driving into a, an Aboriginal community, those signs said no alcohol, no uh, pornographic material, no, um, there was, oh, no drugs. Um, there are a couple of other little disclaimer things that 
all related back to the Northern Territory Emergency Response Act. Out of that act, anyone who was on welfare payments or the social security system in Australia, anyone in remote Aboriginal or Aboriginal communities who were on welfare had to be issued with a basics card and could not have any cash from the social security system. No other Australians were treated this way. And then they abolished this act in 2012. So they allowed it to run for nearly, well, how many years? Five years. Um, so they allowed it to run for five years, but then they abolished that act and implemented another act called the Stronger Futures, Stronger Community Futures Act. And it does the same thing. It restricts people. It treats Indigenous people in such a demeaning way as to suggest that they're all, all the men are drunks, violent, drug addicts who watch pornographic materials. Um, it's, that's where it's, it's just, that's structural violence. Yeah, that's a demeaning a demeaning way to manage people where their services are so um, inaccessible. Yeah, I, I so, want to raise, re-raise that point that when we start talking about Indigenous peace building and peacemaking, mm. as it were, that very often um, the, the, the level of discrimination against Indigenous people isn't uh, easily overcome by um, just addressing it from a uh, from the standpoint of new laws that discrimination mm. is is this underlying thing that happens uh, and seems to be perpetuated often by the very laws that we create so I think we have mm. to understand this differently. Well, let me ask the question to Mong uh, as you know, part of ending discrimination involves getting indigenous community, giving rather, uh, indigenous communities a voice in public life and then considering how their perspectives, their, um, their feelings, their, um, their experiences um, might teach us. So in what ways, um, Mong, can we develop better understanding and knowledge about indigenous ways of peacemaking? Uh... Well, uh, indigenous peoples have uh, been trying to communicate uh, this message at least for many centuries, you know, since the, the time they came under the domination and subjugation of outsiders in the colonial hegemonic power. And the message is very simple, clear, and open-hearted. That is, uh, let us take care of our own life. So what it means by this simple message is that we have our own ways of doing and knowing things, be it our self-governance, environmental management, dispute resolution, or sustainable development. So not only that, we have been practicing, performing, and continuously trying to sustain our distinct way of life at the expense of many precious lives and livelihoods that we have lost in our struggles, being dispossessed from our ancestral land and territories. So yet the dominant society has been awfully ignorant and reluctant to learn and understand the voices and aspiration of indigenous peoples. So it's, uh, as much as it's, it has anything to do with the power and domination, I think it has more to do with the politics of knowledge and the worldview uh, through which we see and construct the reality around us. Uh, I give you an example. Uh, when indigenous peoples talk about the land, land rights, so we are not only claiming our rights to the land to live and thrive, but we are also claiming the very rights of the land itself that needs to be looked after and nurtured for the benefit of all beings. And indigenous peoples' traditional practice of land tenure system and the usage is the living testimony of sustainable management of land and resources. Mm -hmm. So to understand this notion of ownership from the perspective of indigenous peoples, non-indigenous non or Western people need to come out of the confinement of their own way of 
thinking that is viewing the land not as property to be owned or exchanged, but rather belonging to it. So the same applies also to the field of conflict resolution and peace building. And in my opinion, there are uh, definitely many ways to develop better understanding and knowledge about indigenous ways of uh, peacemaking. So education can be the uh, one of the way, uh, but for this to happen, the knowledge has to be pursued respectfully and with good intention. And that has to be done through the eyes, mind, and the hearts of indigenous peoples. I, I appreciate that, Mon, because you, you're talking about um, sort of looking through the eyes, um, through the minds and hearts of the indigenous peoples, and you use the word respect, and I think uh, several times talk about relationships uh, in general. But um, where you and I have talked about relational just, justice as a, as a concept uh, that's related to indigenous peacemaking, can you, can you develop that idea a little bit more? What, uh, what does relational justice look like uh, in your mind? Well, uh, the concept of uh, relationship itself, it entails the taking responsibility and being accountable. Uh, so that means uh, you are accountable, you know, for the disharmony that goes to that relationship uh, by your action or anything that you've done. Uh, as indigenous mm -hmm. society is a collective society, it's a, based on the collective ownership and principles of sharing and caring in order to, you know, maintain the collective well-being. So from, from the shared worldview and belief systems that you know, shape and inform their culture, social norms, which uh, Helen already mentioned earlier, you know, how the indigenous uh, society are bound by the you know, shared norms and customs. So in the conflict resolution context, so when a, uh, something happened like an offense being uh, committed by someone. So that means the crime itself means it's uh, uh, looking through the relational lens is, uh, is the violation, you know, you are deviating yourself from the established social norms that everybody shared. Uh, so you uh, harm that relationship. So the objective is uh, for everyone to own that, you know, the, the, the responsibility to come into a space uh, uh, in, so that they can um, um, try and find a way how to uh, restore that uh, uh, lost relationship. Mm -hmm. So in, in my context, like uh, from my uh, Marma traditional justice system, so we call uh, in our local language as uh, Tara. So Tara it comes from, uh, it means uh, moral principles, not just the justice, the uh, moral principle, which means uh, if I give justice to someone, meaning like uh, I'm trying to restore the lost morals of a person, you know, who is liable for an offense. And so uh, if you look at also, you know, like the historical record or archeological uh, findings that you never see any, uh, jail or anything in the indigenous community because they, uh, they you know you don't need to have any police force to mm. patrol you know crime or to control crimes because the morals that the shared values and the elders they are the police they are the law you know so everyone's respected everyone know how what to do the everyone knows their responsibilities and uh, the harshest penalty is like uh, the harshest penalty we have in my community is uh, not murder, killing, you know, uh, is some, uh, excluding someone from the community. If you've done something very serious crime to the community, you bring shame. So you, you would be compelled to, you know, to be excluded from the community, which means you have no relationship. So in our culture, what we believe is if you don't have a, a person without relationship, is not a human being, you know, so mm. yeah, that's how, uh, we understand by relational justice. Yeah, you know, mm. I learn a lot just uh, as you're talking about this sort of social morality and 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 what governs um, the relationships in in indigenous uh, among indigenous peoples. Um, it's interesting to me that things that are important to people that are non-indigenous are also important to indigenous peoples. They care. We care about the same sorts of things, but we may set it up very differently. And, uh, and 
implicit in what you're suggesting is that relationships uh, matter and that relationality really goes three ways. It's not just about um, my relationship with you. It's about uh, relationships between humans, among humans, but also relationships with nature and spirituality. And so, Richa, uh, can, I, can you talk to that? I mean, if indigenous ethics teach us that humans have a custodial relationship with nature and that spirituality connects everything in the world, what does a, what does a peaceful society look like from your perspective? Definitely. Um, a peaceful society from my perspective is one where we all take radical self-responsibility for how we treat ourselves, for how we treat the planet and how we treat each other. And where we are truly connected to ourselves, nature and community. Um, it is a society where we are collaborative instead of competitive or being extractive. Um, it's a society where we look at things holistically um, rather than just singling out the the um, the problems uh, and not looking at the whole thing, um, and where we're compassionate and we celebrate each other. Um, but I do want to come back and talk to a little bit about what Mong was talking about and what you talked about um, relationality, and you talked about how Indigenous non-Indigenous people have so many similarities, of course. Um, and, I, and I truly believe that we human beings are wired um, to care about relationships because we know somewhere a deep knowing of, of, of a time when a deep knowing of a time that we knew that if we didn't have relationships, we wouldn't survive. And that is why by default, we seek for approval and we seek for validation from our friends, our family and our communities. And we all do. And this is, this is because we want to fit in because if we don't fit in, then we're out. And like Mong said, if you're outcasted, you don't survive. And, you know, thousands of years ago, when we were living in tribes and communities in the middle of nowhere in jungles, if you were outcasted, if you were not, I won't say fit in, but if you did something wrong, and if you were outcasted, you just wouldn't survive the world um, on your own. Like being in community was so important um, to be protected protected against predators and to to have food and all of those things um and and i think i just want to bring that back to ourselves and and how we can translate that to our relating to the planet and how we treat it um, indigenous people are often called traditional owners custodians stewards um as as they have over thousands of years really cracked the code of coexisting with nature peacefully and during this long time they figured out that taking care of of land means taking care of themselves and taking care of community and that relationship with land comes first and that relationship with land then facilitates the relationship that we have with ourselves that deep connection that i'm talking about and and you know we all know like gardening and tending to ground and grounding and putting our feet in sand feels really good and it like really drops us in and connects us to ourselves while we're connecting with nature so um i know i've kind of been all over the place but i think for for me the a peaceful society is one where there's not just a few things happening there's it's a really holistic um ecosystem of, of relationships in nature and spirituality and connection I think you come across loud, loudly, clearly that um, that land is not something that we can never be separated from. Yes, uh, we, we are not separate from land. We are part of it and it is part of us. You just caused me to think about on a, on a different day, I enjoyed hearing from Dr. Mary Graham. She's an, another Aboriginal philosopher at the University of Queensland. And she described how an indigenous man pointed to a particular hill in the distance and commented that that hill over there is my uncle. As one would talk about a relative, he felt obliged to look after it. That, that, and that kind of 
lore of obligation isn't really practiced in non-indigenous societies. So Richard, what does, does that make sense to you coming from an indigenous society? How would social political ordering in your society take into account things like, say, sorting out or planning or working with land in a way that doesn't harm the resources? It's so interesting you bring um, that quote up because 10 years ago when I was traveling through Australia and, and driving, literally I could see Uluru and driving towards Uluru, this very recording was playing. Um, when this Aboriginal man said that hill over there is my uncle and in that moment I literally broke down into tears um, in this beautiful landscape of Australia looking at the Uluru and I was in tears of joy because I resonated with that so deeply for me my heart was like finally somebody else gets it and somebody else feels the same way that I do about land. Land always comes first. Without land, we are nothing. And mm. you know, 10 years on, um, I, I've uh, just recently, I was in a Indigenous awareness training for work. And one of the exercises that we got was we all got little, little um, cards with words like culture, pride, food, um, um, land. And we had to sort them out. We had to put them, you know, top to bottom in order of what we thought was important. And we had to do it in teams. And so my team went ahead and put land on top and, you know, culture and pride all slotted in underneath. And we really talked about it. And I was the only other Indigenous person in the room um, other than the facilit facilitator. And um, we talked it through. And, and it was really interesting later when everyone else had to show what, what their responses were. A lot of people put, you know, pride or people first. And it really tells you the, 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 the difference in values. And even though I grew up and I've been living in, in the Western world for a while now, it's like, that is so innate in me, that connection to land and that like, feet like just, just that connection to land is so innate in me it's just there it's just it's always been there and it'll always be there and it was really interesting to hear other people's reasoning why you know people or pride came first and for me I was just like if there is no land there is no us like if if the land is sick we are sick if the earth is sick we are sick and and that is where we find ourselves in in this time on the planet right now with climate change and so many different things happening. It's like the land is sick. And so we are sick. Right. Yeah. I really mm -hmm. appreciate you bringing that. We, of course, we're talking about indigenous relational ethos and relationships. And hopefully it's really clear to everybody when, in terms of peace building, the relationships are really significant when we consider what peace means from Aboriginal perspectives. So Helen, uh, in the remaining uh, few minutes that we have, um, I have a couple other questions, but one for you in particular. I want to ask you about your insight into another aspect of peace building, because surely there are different cultural or social systems that exist in Aboriginal cultures. Can you help us better understand what types of social or cultural systems are observed in Aboriginal peace initiatives or practices like how is peace established when conflict arises in an Aboriginal community and who takes charge of the peacemaking? Well, I, I want to start out with a statement because I think that it's just trying to calibrate with non-Indigenous peoples this idea of peace in an Indigenous setting. So um, I wanted to start out with this, but I chose not to. But it seems to me that non-Indigenous people have generally misplaced this whole idea of connection and, um, and um, connections we, and relationships to country, to people, to the flora and fauna. And um, the esoteric web that draws us into our country because it comes from our country. And so when 
I just want to relate this in a way that can be gelled. And you think about the Scottish and their highlands and their absolute um, un abiding love of the highlands, of their songs and ceremonies that they um, practice in honour of their highlands. Well, those similarities, and in fact, because we've held them for so much longer and haven't forgotten them, they remain instilled in the elders and senior people in communities, these, these strong uh, rules that, um, that have been designed by the ancestors because they had such a long time to work out what worked and what didn't in isolation to the rest of the world, or in Australia that is, vastly uninterrupted. So those elders are the, the tome of knowledge that walk in the community. And so people um, revere many of them, not all of them, some have been colonised in their heads, to be greedy people or to be, you know, selfish. But there are um, quite a few who carry this knowledge and um, um, this abiding love of the, the, the symmetry and the um, serendipitous connection between the, each person, who they are, who they belong to. So some of those are related to the kinship structures such as um, the Tiwi Island people. I'm going to use them as the example because um, I have worked quite extensively with the Tiwi Islander people. They have um, a skin group system comprising of four different groups and they it tells you who they're allowed to talk to, who they're allowed to marry and so if you put the, um, a circle on a north, south, east, west axis, the people who are opposite each other are related. So they can only marry either way to their left or to their right. That's the marriage system. So it tells them who they can speak to, who they may eat with, what they may eat with these people. And it is through this skin group system that they sort out who is the most appropriate person and they know those rules. I don't, I had to learn these rules um, because I'm not Tiwi and most people who go there to do work don't understand the governance system of relationships in the community. So they will use the elders who carry that knowledge to help them organise how they're going to approach um, the um, conflicting parties and who may approach those conflicting parties, who will be appointed to support a person whom the other party is not allowed to sit with or talk to. So it, it ends up being a... Um, quite a um, empathetic, organised way of, of defining how they can assist and who might be the best person and the right person to assist. Uh, it's really a mindful social system and it's, it's been alive for millennia. For how and it's been well... So when, when, when the legal system overrides that, it diminishes this very important role that the elders play and the knowledge that they have of who might be um, involved in supporting people to problem solve. I'm sorry, Peter, you're going to say? No worries. I mean, it just comes across loudly to me that uh, the elders play a really important role and that trust is a really critical part of uh, and respect within indigenous oh, yeah. cultural and social structures as a, as a pathway towards building peace. And 
And I want mm. to come back to the idea that Mong introduced. Mong, the, the thought keeps going through my head um, that from an indigenous perspective, we have relational obligations. But I think I've been raised in a society, a non-indigenous society, that has put a lot more emphasis on survivalist thinking, that is looking out for myself and less on relational thinking. So how can our relationship, Mong, um, with land become a template for the kind of relationship we have with each other? Uh, yeah. Uh, so land, uh, we, we believe as indigenous people, land is the holder of knowledge and relationship, which means if you pay, uh, pay close, uh, close attention to the uh, things, you know, on the land. So you get knowledge of for many things. Uh, now, if you just take a moment and, you know, reflect uh, yourself, how much attention have we been paying, you know, uh, to the land on which we are living? The, bar the songs of the birds and squirrels and possums, they all have knowledge agencies and they communicate each other. But us, the human being, you know, living in this uh, urban landscape, uh, our senses and feelings are so much occupied by the noises and sounds of the traffic, electronics items, and we really don't get to learn anything from the nature and the land. So the land that has, you know, so much to teach us in terms of how to live uh, peacefully and sustainably. So I'll tell you, uh, let me share a story. Uh, no, it's not a story, it's still a, a practice, you know, a traditional practice of our people, Marma people, uh, in terms of uh, how they engage with the land and along with that, based on their engagement, you know, the principles they adopted in their so uh, social, uh, societal and political life in the community. Uh, yeah, so, uh, in our people has been uh, practicing this uh, f f uh, method of like uh, agricultural system, which is known as uh, jum cultivation in our local language or shifting cultivation, you know, widely. So uh, it's an, an ancient farming practiced uh, across also in Asia. Uh, this type of cultivation, uh, People believe that uh, it's derived from a profound way of sustainable living and uh, nurturing the land and environment guided by the ancestral knowledge and, and teachings. Uh, so in this system of uh, cultivation, uh, if I just uh, briefly um, share the, how they engage and the methods and spirituality involved, uh, certain plots of hilly slopes are selected, cleared, burned, and planted with a variety of native vegetables, herbs, and other essential crops that are um, vital for their su uh, sustaining a healthy life and well-being. So in a full cycle of jum, uh, jum cultivation also involves several stages. Uh, that includes the pre uh, preparation, rituals, and dreaming, and the burning, planting, and harvesting. And each of these stages performed in conformity with uh, one's customary law, uh, social norms and uh, cultural and spiritual beliefs. And after the harvesting of the crops, the land used for jum cultivation is left for eight to around like 15 years. That is known as fallow period to help it to regenerate and you know regain its uh, growth and return to good, uh, good health. So what principle and, and uh, that teaches us that uh, this very way of engaging with the land is, is uh, it teaches us, uh, you know, the respect when you engage with the, that uh, uh, in the jum cultivation, the way they do these rituals and the ceremonies. So that's a kind of uh, offering respect to the land that uh, even the dreaming, you know, before you. Uh, Select when you select a plot of land, you have to uh, go and, uh, and perform a ritual, and then next day you uh, that ritual you will pray for a dream, you know. So in that dream, that will uh, the dream, uh, dream will determine whether you can be, you know, you can uh, cultivate on that specific uh, plot of land or not. So that that's the knowledge, you know, the connection, the and the belief that 
connects with the uh, you know li life and heart and the uh, land, and that translates into their uh, societal life s such a way that when people also go to the forest or even you cross a river, every time they pay respect to the spirit, you know. So it's, it's very common. I learned from my, uh, the, uh, in my childhood as well, like it's still uh, we have to do it. So that keeps you, you know, that uh, the kind of, uh, the, the connection that you not because the land is uh, providing you you know like means to live and all the knowledge that you need to sustain your life so you also have the responsibility you know obligation to uh, maintain its growth and nurture it so when we put that into our human relationship that is uh, the respect you know the listening deeply when you listen deeply to the nature and you learn, you always uh, gain knowledge from that. So in terms of our in, uh, interaction between, you know, different uh, human beings, that uh, we also have to learn that, you know, deep listening because and uh, listening is not just uh, you paying attention to what someone is saying. You have to pay attention to what actually he's saying from what perspective and, you know, what background and what experiences. So yeah and then yeah. uh yeah those those are the things that we can uh, learn from you know and then uh, uh practice in our life yeah I, I you know i'm astonished because when i think about peace building from an indigenous perspective um what i realize is that i don't even know uh, enough to start that conversation in an intelligent way but that's been part of the message that you just shared that rich has shared that helen shared is that we have a lot to learn. Uh, and I say we, meaning non-Indigenous people, can really learn uh, a lot uh, from the way that a peace, a peace is approached uh, from, um, from Indigenous peoples. Um, so I, I appreciate uh, just thinking about land as a teacher, um, uh, land as, be, as having that, that quality of being a, a teacher. And um, those of you who are thinking, Oh, we're we going to have breakout sessions. Uh, the facilitators are probably thinking, what about our part? Well, you're part of the compromise here um, as we really evolve, evolve here. I do want to give us about, you know, at least 10 minutes to, to settle on some really key ideas. But before we do, um, Rich, uh, can you just lead us down a very personal road uh, from an indigenous person perspective, your perspective? Um, do we do enough? to recognize the existence, struggles, and needs of indigenous peoples around the world? Is, is that even the best way to frame that question? Because I don't know what it's like to be indigenous. Uh, in short, no. Um, I don't think we do enough. <laughs> um, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting place where we're at right now with, um, Black Lives Matter becoming so center stage. And I think it's a really um, beautiful, painful moment for all of us as, as, as a collective, indigenous, non-indigenous. I think this has brought about a lot of um, personal stories of discrimination for me. It has led me to take a lot of action and speak up about not you know about black lives matter but also about indigenous lives matter and there are so many similarities in the narrative around you know indigenous people and black people and you know especially with what helen talked about right in the start about how um aboriginal people were treated in australia and it's it's similar or in india you know i mean mob mobbling lynching of of indigenous people is happening um rapes, killings, mob violence and, and is happening and social inju injustices are happening every day um, to Indigenous people and I feel like that awareness is not really there because and a, and a lot of you know I think non non even non-white non-Indigenous people um, would, would resonate that sometimes um, our stories are not there, 
no one's there one no one's there to tell the story and our stories are not told and so this is a really beautiful example of how we we get to start and we get to we get to start creating awareness and and of course there are many other ways but i think just giving not not just giving indigenous people the space and the place but also really deeply listening and in in engaging and and for me that that has been this process with you peter it's been very great to you know do all the back and forth in the last week also in this conversation um and and i guess my invitation to everyone in that space is it's you know learn and you will make mistakes and and you will not use the right terms and that's okay but keep learning and keep growing and keep being curious about indigenous literature and indigenous teachings and culture and 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 really seeing that there is so much value and there's so much that we can learn and take away from from indigenous culture from all over the world and um and also to just really get out of our heads and get in our bodies and our hearts and that is, I truly believe that when we talk about connection and this, this connection to land and, and seeing land as teacher, it's we're really talking about unlearning that way of only being from logic because there is a lot of magic outside of being logical and we miss out on all of that. And I think that is what dreaming and, and the Indigenous way is about. Richa, thank you very much. And, you know, we are officially over at 245, and I, I was just thinking about teapots. Do you know how a teapot, when it boils, it whistles, and, you know, it lets off that pressure? We need to break out to the facilitation groups just to let um, people's teapots um, uh, whistle. So come back at 2, uh, we'll come back at 243. Um, facilitators, if there's a main idea or one sentence that you want to share from a short brief discussion, then that will be appropriate time. But we're ready to break uh, into those sessions, um, uh, Elizabeth. And since we haven't broken yet, let me just publicly thank Richa and Helen and Mong, who I think have been dynamic and a great part of my personal learning. So thank you for being with us. And anybody who has questions, I know that there were lots of chatter. Um, their bios are available online. So if you want to engage with them directly, I'm sure that they're accessible. Uh, and um, I just am grateful that we had this time. So thank you all. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. All the facilitators, make sure your name is on the, the right side of your, um, your title is in your name, okay? Okay, one second. Okay, I'm almost done. I think we are almost there. Okay, and okay, if if I reassign you differently, I'll get you out, but so far it's you have some sessions. Okay.
Daigi, can you hear me? Yes. Can you also go through the list and make sure that they're paired up, please? Elizabeth? Yes. I, I ended up in a breakout room with, there was two other facilitators already in there, so I just came out. I don't yes. know if I'm supposed to be somewhere else. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. I'm gonna put you in a different room. Yeah, sorry. Because some of them put the facilitator a little bit later, but um, I'm gonna move you to... Um, Andrew was... Andrew was in my room as well, but and his he I don't know, he said on his thing facilitator, so I'm not sure. Okay, so we have they're all connecting, just one second. Okay. Yeah. Facilitator not joined, not joined, not joined. One, two, three. Have you been moved? No, you're still here. Sorry. Let's see. Panelist. Yeah, I think we have, I think, much more facilitators than I thought we did. Facilitator. So who's in the session right now? Okay. And in the session, from everyone in the session right now, who is the facilitator? So Abby and I think it's you in the session. But are we in, so, oh, but we're in the main room, right? Yes, but it's, it's, we're still okay. going to come back. Okay. So, sorry, do you, you want me to yes, so, facilitate yeah, I now? Put, yes, I put people okay. in different groups and... Um, this is people, a group? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, hello, is anyone... I can see, I can't see any faces. I don't know. Is anyone here and active. Can't see any faces or hear anyone. <laughs> if anyone's here, please say hi or turn on your video. Just let me know that you're here. Hello. Hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry, I've been having audio problems. Yeah, sorry, we seem to have had some issues with the breakout rooms. Um, and we've got two minutes <laughs> before we get, we've got two minutes before we go back to um the main session. So um does anyone have any reflections? Um, on what we heard that they would like to share with the group. Um, as we're so short on time, please just, uh, just start talking. So is it just reflections or is there a specific question that you had in mind? Um, yeah, as we've only got a minute, <laughs> um, we're, we're not going to have time to do any of the, the questions. I think we've, we've just got time for um, any kind of immediate reflections on yeah. the panel discussion. So with regards to, I personally enjoyed 
the indigenous um, aspect that was discussed. Um, I'm from Peru and I originate from the Quechua community and that's uh, from the Inca uh, origin. So it's very interesting to see how, yes, because there's a lot of um, new, how to say, technological advancements and lots of constructions, a lot of areas are being uh, consumed and a lot of uh, construction is happening with that. Having said that, a lot of rural communities are being like being pushed out. Um, so we're losing language and we're losing a lot of the cultural aspects that come with, um, in my opinion, like what indigenous culture should represent. So there's a lot of minimization happening. But with that um, and with COVID currently, there's a lot of dangers too. Um, but speaking out on these dangers, I think, could really um, help bring awareness to Indigenous communities um, and help at least save some lives. Thank you. Does anyone else have any reflections? I think we're about to rejoin the main. Are we rejoining, Elizabeth? Rejoining. Okay. Really sorry. We. <laughs> We had some problems there, but thanks, Luz, for sharing your your thoughts. Yes, I think with the time frame, people um, it went a little bit over. So at least the is the session due to end now. This is two forty five. Okay, we're all returning in 60 seconds. So you can actually, if you would like, you can continue for a couple more seconds. But okay, <laughs> did anyone else have any, any final reflections? Uh, okay, everyone's coming back. Thank you. Yeah. I, thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth is our is our gem, uh, and she's not working alone. Um, thank you. I want to thank you publicly. Um, yeah. We finished up, but let let me just give the facilitators a chance to make a, a statement each, um, and um, and then I will wrap up. So I don't know your order, but maybe. Um, Abby, we can start with you. Yes, just something very briefly is, I think we had more facilitators um, than we thought, and then the, the names came back a little bit later. So if you were in a group with two facilitators, um, I think then you could, you could still give the turn to the, the floor to whoever took the note. Um, but yes, move forward. Abby? Abigail, you look frozen, maybe? Yeah. Um, sorry, we weren't, um, we had some technical difficulties, so we weren't able to actually have a discussion. <laughs> sorry to hear that. Um, why don't we move down the line? If you are a facilitator, then just speak up and uh, we'll give you space. Our reporter is Warren. <laughs> That's all right, I can. Um, the, perhaps one of the key points that came out, and there were quite a number in a short space of time, is that if you give Indigenous people rights, but you don't recognise their worldview, their history or their culture, then you perhaps create a greater damage than uh, if you hadn't done anything. Strong point. Thank you, Warren. As a, uh, next group, is there another facilitator that would like to um, piggyback on that? Please do. Okay, I can say hello. Yeah. I was a facilitator. I sort of switched rooms. I was in um, in Warren's room, and then I got whisked away to another room. But um, our reporter is uh, Mildul in India. So if you could report on our very short discussion. Yeah, hi everyone, this is Mridul. I'm connecting from India. So we were three people and we definitely really like um, how like deep 
the thoughts and insights were from all the panelists and at the same time um, how articulated they were so that they could really convey some of the points that we really wanted to maybe um, take out from this session uh, very specifically about connection between land and indigenous people that was something a highlight for us and then uh, one of the afterthought was how we can also maybe hear more about indigenous practices uh, in the religious spaces because when we talk about peace building there is a lot uh, which comes from religious practices uh, and like this this intersection between religions or among religions uh, so having that space and some insights from there uh, that that was something we wanted to look forward to learn more and maybe get connected with the panelists later and hear more from them Thank you. I know that the session has stirred up lots more questions than we have answers, and that's great. That's what we need. Belinda, you had something you wanted to say. You're muted, Belinda. You're, you're muted. Okay, there. yeah. Um, yeah, we, we wanted to, the discussion was amazing, and we had a big conversation about having more questions and answers, um, wanting to understand how you find out more, um, and feeling very sort of humbled by our lack of knowledge, um, you know, particularly in an Australian context as well. Um, and moving forward, what would that look like and how do we make change happen? Great. We had another, just because I have the names on the right, um, I think one of our biggest groups had two facilitators, so Medium or Raymond Kima. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm C. Kaya. Uh, I think that uh, we didn't have a chance to get uh, to talk to everyone in that big group, but um, from what we heard, I think there was a real gratitude towards the speech, the speakers, and we were lucky to have Helen in our group, actually. And I think uh, there was some points of, of the difficulty of, of uh, thinking about peace building and peacemaking in this time of, of great global violence um, and division, but at the same time, the power of listening and learning and uh, most importantly, open communication uh, is really the way forward. Perfect. The next person, Maria Arsenas. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, we had only, uh, we were only three in our session. This was Morgan Briggs from Brisbane and uh, Leticia from New York. Well, um, I think the reaction was really more that we had to learn more about our indigenous communities and take that effort. And I think it really struck a lot of uh, insights into how they felt about how things were going. But I think we really need more time to do the uh, to do our breakout sessions. And we also had technical difficulties because Leticia came rather late, uh, you know, while M Morgan and I were, were were there. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Yes, apologies for the distribution, but um, I it's glad to hear that you all went great. Some of you, uh, Kiran King is the next facilitator listed. Kiran King. Okay, we can maybe come back. Belinda. She spoke already. Okay, sorry. And and Andrew, did Andrew speak? Uh, yeah, at the beginning, our, yes. Our okay. reporter, our reporter spoke, yes. Okay, sorry. So I I don't know what happened to Kiran King, but that's the last one in the list. Then then let me just uh, in closing say thank you to everybody. Um, I, for one, um, we could do this whole conference again just on the subject because there's so many different angles, but I think what comes across clearly from my discussion in the breakout session with, with, with those in my group was that, that we're really at the beginning. We're at the beginning of, uh, of trying to improve the way education is uh, handled in our communities, uh, beginning of the way to um, to give legitimacy to ideas that might not be something that we grew up with, but might be important for us to adopt. Uh, we're at the beginning of, uh, of trying to pay attention 
to uh, exactly what Helen and Mong and Richard were talking about so that we can mainstream um, the, the concepts that are so important in peace building from their perspectives to make them part of uh, how our societies work. Uh, it really just suggests that we have, um, we're at the cusp or the beginning of, uh, of a, a future that is going to be shaped, uh, at least I hope so, by indigenous ways of thinking. And I, I appreciate all of you being here. We are wrapped up if, um, unless anybody Thank you, wants Peter. to. You're most welcome. Yeah, I uh, just want to thank everyone for joining the session and Peter especially for running smoothly and nicely. For all the nice work and you have done last couple of days. And Elaine for organizing this. It's been really wonderful. Um, yeah, have a good afternoon. Enjoy the rest of the time. And maybe see you in some other sessions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Do we close? Are we moving to a new room, um, Peter? So, um, is it no, so we're wrapped up, uh, Helen. Um, okay, so I can leave the room? You can, and thank you very much. Oh, thank you all. Good day, Helen. Good to see you. G'day, mate. How are you? Good. <laughs> Nicely done. I saw, oh, I saw Tony Bowman was online too. Yeah, I did. I saw that too. I didn't get a chance to say hello to her, but um, yeah. Neither did I. I, I saw her at the last minute. <laughs> hmm, okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you very okay. much, everyone. Catch Bye. you again, hey. Bye. Well done, Peter. Yeah, thank you, yeah. everyone. Bye. Thank you. And thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much. Um,